Hi, Bob here with JD Squared. I really appreciate you tuning in. Anyway, what I have right here is an XR12 setup with 8 inch channel. Now, in order to cut shapes that aren't round, square, or rectangle, you're going to need some kind of fixturing system in order to hold those components in the machine, such as what you're seeing right here. So we're going to need to rotate this stuff in order to cut it on all the sides. Let me go ahead and whip this back over there. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do over the next three videos or so is I'm going to describe the different components and then how they all go together. In this particular video, we're going to be talking about the jig plate and pretty much only the jig plate. The next video, we will be discussing the ring adapters and how they're used. And then in the third video, we'll put it all together and we'll come out here and we'll cut this channel and maybe some um, angle or something simple like that also. Well, anyway, without further ado, let's get after that jig plate. As I mentioned earlier, this is the jig plate right here. These are also jig plates. This particular one happens to come out of an XR6, so it was really designed to handle up to six inch square, anything that would fit into that envelope. However, even on our XR6, we can make a larger jig plate to spin larger items. So for instance, we had a customer who had an XR6 and he called me up and he goes, hey Bob, I got an opportunity to do this really good job, but I have to be able to cut eight inch channel, but I've got your XR6, can you help me out? Sure, that's what our job is here, to keep you busy. So what I did, we just real quick designed a jig plate that is compatible in the XR6, and I'm pointing at it like you could actually see it. There's an XR6 over there. But anyway, this particular jig was done to handle almost specifically channel, C-channel, up to eight inches, and it works perfectly well in an XR6. Now, looking at a jig plate, let's talk about the jig plate itself right here. The purpose of the jig plate is to allow us to adapt different shapes that aren't easily accommodated with a square jaw chuck that we typically use in our machines right here. Now, to do that, on the back real quick, just to show you, and once again, this video is as much a tutorial for people who already have our machine as it is just showing you what's going on. On the back, you're gonna have a arbor that has been machined on four sides. That's gonna allow you to chuck it into a four jaw chuck, clamp down on it really tight, and it won't slip. That's why the flats, let me see if I get a little closer. That's why those flats are there right there. Now, let's turn our attention to the face. You'll see a lot of drilled and tapped holes. Those are 12 millimeter holes. Remember, all of our machinery, other than our tube benders, are done metric. Now, we got a series of 12 millimeter holes, but if you look, I'm gonna get a little closer here. Let's give the, the auto focus time to stabilize. If you notice, you'll see a grid of squares around this jig plate. What they are, those are alignment aids, and these squares are one inch square. Now, what that's gonna allow you to do is utilizing the blocks, which I will explain how, they are, how, they, how they're used in a minute. It allows you to position these blocks onto the faceplate so that we can precisely position the workpiece in relation to the center of rotation. What the heck does he mean by that? The idea is that our software Camelot that's gonna generate the code to cut, for instance, this eight inch channel, basically you gotta tell Camelot where the center of rotation is. Now, if you look at a lot of structural pieces, they're not even inches. So for instance, eight inch channel, this particular one right here, Sure, it's eight inches wide, no problem. But the flange length is like 2.286 inches. It's some weird number, right? Not easily accommodated um, in a chuck or even with adapters in a chuck. That's where the jig plates come in. So what we do, utilizing the blocks, we want to position our workpiece. In this case, it's a piece of three inch angle iron so that it is a known distance from the center of rotation, which is your arbor back here, right? Now, to do that, we're gonna use those engravings as a reference. <clears throat> Alrighty, believe it or not, that's really all there is to talk about the jig plate itself. Let's turn our attention to the blocks because that's where it gets a little more interesting. I'm holding in my hand 
three positioning blocks. If you notice, there's three different kind of fasteners. We have a hex bolt, which is my preferred fastener. We have a socket head cap screw, which would be used on particular blocks. I'll show you why. And then we have a set screw. The set screw would be used in a place to where the clearances are a little bit on the tight side. As I mentioned, I like the hex bolt because I could just use a 19 millimeter or three quarter inch wrench and I could rapidly tighten down and lock my part into place. Now, if you notice on the blocks, the tapped side hole has been offset from this surface up. That was solely done to provide clearance for a hex head bolt, make sure that that wrench could get in there. So whenever you bolt these onto the jig plate, you're gonna to want to bolt them on the jig plate so that the thread is further away from the surface and that way you better get the wrench on. Anyway, now we make blocks in different thicknesses. Now these all happen to be the same, I'm sorry, width, same width, but we make them in varying thicknesses and a good example would be on this plate right here to where you can see we have a much, much narrower block up here than these are right here. Typically we make them in inch and a, inch and a quarter increments, uh, or like one and a quarter inch wide, inch and a half wide, seven eighths inch wide. Depending on what you're locking onto the jig plate would determine what block you needed. So for instance, this particular jig plate right here, what I've done is I've used two, well actually these are inch and a half wide blocks, but a characteristics of the blocks if you look at them, you can see how the hole is offset to one side. From this face here to the center of that bolt on this block is one half of an inch. From here to the center of the bolt, it's one inch, which means we can flip this block around. And right now, when you're on the half inch increment, you can see where we're lined up with that engraved edge, one of the one inch um, squares. If we flip it around, the edge of the block will now be in the middle of the one inch square which means if we were doing something like three and a half inch square tubing, we would flip that around. So you're gonna use the grid pattern to help position the blocks. Now, on this particular setup, I've got this setup to handle, for instance, four by six rectangular tubing. So all I did is I put one of the long blocks, it's got the two inch spacing on the holes, and I positioned it, if you see the edge is right, here's our center here, we're one, two, we're two inches off center. Four inches divided by two equals two. Now on the six inch side, I did the same thing. I am now three squares away, but I have the edge directly on the line. So when I load the tubing, it's gonna go into the jig and it's gonna, face, it's gonna go against this face and this face. Now, if you look at these two here, you can see, hopefully, that this one is offset an eighth of an inch off the line. The reason that it is done is because when's the last time you saw a piece of square tubing that was perfectly square? They typically may have a bulge in them or something at the weld seam. That eighth inch extra clearance there is provided for that reason to accommodate the bulge. So this particular block here is actually a seven eighths of an inch wide block. Three eighths on one side, half inch on the other. So we could flip it around and use it as a conventional block if we were dealing with something that was on an even inch increment, like two by two, three by three, something like that. Anyway, now this one here, I just took a standard block, flipped it upside down so that we have a half inch clearance now, because remember, we're gonna come out one, two inches. So the four inches is from here to this line. This leaves us a half inch gap so that we can lock our uh, workpiece in place. Now, sometimes, when you tighten these bolts down, you can see where they may try to, to mar the surface a little bit. So what you may want to do is just have a little piece of flat metal hanging around, eighth inch thick, three millimeters, something like that. So you could just put in between the head or the, the thread side of the bolt and your workpiece to keep from marring your workpiece. But that is the general idea right there. Now, another thing about blocks to talk about. Let's use this as an example. This is a piece of three inch rectangular tubing placed on this face plate. Now, I did just what I did earlier. I positioned these blocks, but this time I did do what I said. I flipped the block around. So if you notice, the edge of the channel is in the middle of the one inch grid, which it should be. It's three inches, right? Inch and a half on each side. So I did it on both sides. Then in inside, 
I placed another block that is the clamping block. Now all these blocks um, will be drilled and tapped. Now that is, sometimes isn't necessary, so if you do have a block that isn't drilled and tapped, it's meant to be a backstop, not a clamping block. But all clamping blocks have a threaded hole in it. So if you look at it right now, I've got this thing locked in pretty darn good, but we referenced off the outside of the angle iron. So that's how we did it for that. Now, that brings a, a good point. If we're referencing off of certain items, we're going to reference off the, the outside of the workpiece, right? So clamp, clamp on the inside. However, Depending on the job, you may have to reference off the inside of the workpiece, such as channel. We're not going to reference off the edge or the top here. We're actually going to reference off one flange and the underside, the inside of the web. I'll explain that in the next videos of why we do that. That's why I love traveling head machines, because we're allowed to do that. And my Pinocchio machine can't do that. So anyway. Let me give you one more example because interestingly enough, I was getting ready to shoot this video and one of our customers who got our machine uh, called our tech line and said, hey, I'm trying to grab inch and a half, quarter inch wall angle and I, I'm really not sure how to do it. Can you help me out? Let's go ahead and show him how to do it. I've gone ahead and I selected two inch and a quarter wide blocks which means on one side we have an offset of half inch and on the other side we have an offset of three quarters of an inch which is perfect because we have to offset this inch and a half angle iron one three quarters of an inch from the center of the jig plate. So I bolted them down using the grid as a reference I was able to easily locate them where they're going to go. Then I just used a regular everyday block on the outside here and what that's going to allow me to do is take my angle iron, place it onto the jig plate, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use one of the other blocks as a spacer. So I put that in there, and this is why I like the hex bolt, because all I have to do now is use my wrench, lock it in, and we are good to go right there. You can see where we got the block. Let me see, I hope I got that. We got the block where we could do that. Now, say I didn't have an inch and a quarter wide block. I only had inch and a half or, or, or the one inch ones. What I would do then, I just find myself a quarter inch spacer and use that to make up the difference. Uh, having said that, I don't know how many jig plate systems we shipped out with inch and a quarter blocks, but uh, if you've got one and you don't have the inch and a quarter block, Email support, we'd be happy to send them to you for free. We're, we're still kind of getting our feel. I know we've been building these things for a couple years, but every once in a while we just run across something we didn't think of originally. So if you don't have an inch and a quarter block, if you like one, we'd be happy to ship it to you for free. Anyway, um, as I mentioned, there's other tricks to setting up jig plates, but it's best described when we're actually loading up parts, and I'm really referencing the C channel right here. So. With that, with that in mind, I think I've covered everything about the jig plates that I could, that I could think of. Anyway, really appreciate you for tuning in. Hope you have a great day. And um, check out the next video on the ring adapter system. And eventually, hopefully in a couple of days, you'll know how to cut this, this C-channel no problem. Have a great day. Goodbye.